beautiful song, and thank you so much for sharing that with us, Mallory. Do you believe that the angels sing with us when we worship? Do you believe that they come and join us and are in this place where God's name is honored and where we seek to worship Him? I think there are times um, when worship can be so sweet that I close my eyes and I can almost hear them. And I just don't know. I am uh, very blessed by the worship today. Thank you for our leaders for leading out. I think it was great. I think it was great. I think the angels were singing with us. Um, God is so good, isn't he? We have a few copies of this book um, still on the table out there. Um, did any of you get a chance to start looking through it yet? Anyone flip through it? Here, my good. Um, again, I just want to share. I don't think you'll regret it. Uh, again, it's tiny, a little book. You could, if if you're an, even an average reader, you could probably read it in an afternoon. But if you took your time and made it into a devotional, I think it'd be well worth your uh, time. It was something that uh, was emphasized by one of our speakers here recently, and we wanted to make some copies available. I just want to read just one little paragraph um, from the book, just to maybe whet your appetite a little bit or just share something that was a blessing to me. Really, the, the basis of the book is an analysis of what does the spiritual life look like and how does the carnal life look and, and how do we tell the difference and how do we know that the Spirit is working in our life. And uh, in one of the passages, it says this, the spiritual person is the true Christian. He is called spiritual because he's filled with the Holy Spirit. It says that he has a good and growing relationship with the Holy Spirit. And here's the part. Jesus is in the center of his life, which is largely what I talked about last week. And I, I made a big deal about moving everything so that the cross would be in the middle. And then I forgot to really emphasize it later. But I left the cross up here um, to emphasize the centrality of the, the, the person and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in our life. And that's what the author says here too. Jesus is in the center of his life. We also say that he's on the heart's throne. He goes on to say, I'm trying to abbreviate because uh, it's a long paragraph. The spiritual person has committed himself. Now notice this. The spiritual person has committed himself essentially and completely to Jesus. And as a general rule, this is confirmed daily by surrendering himself to Jesus every morning with everything he is and everything he has. In Laodicea, he's called hot. In the parable of the virgins, he's called wise. In Galatians, it says uh, even more about it. And in John, it says he experiences life more abundantly. And Paul expresses it that you may be filled with all the fullness of of God. And just that thought alone that Scripture teaches when Jesus is at the center of our life, we are filled with the fullness of God. When you really dwell on a thought like that, it is quite overwhelming. How many of you spent a thoughtful hour this week contemplating the life of Christ? Some of you are bold enough to raise your hand. I'm glad for that. It can be rhetorical, some nods of heads. How many of you spent a thoughtful hour every day this week? I'm not going to look. <laughs> it's between you and the Lord. Um, that was one of the passages uh, I mentioned last week from Spirit of Prophecy from Desire of Ages. And um, I'll show it again here in just a few minutes. Let me pray with you this morning. God in heaven, please come and uh, anoint this time that we have together, Lord. Anoint the words that are spoken, my lips, and the, every thought and everything that precedes uh, moving forward would be from your throne room. Thank you, God, that your angels are here amongst us and your attention is here on this place and you are in every heart. You are reading every mind and you are desiring goodness for us and mercy and power and courage. So, Lord, thank you and bless this time we have in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm doing a series called Faith Matters and looking at different elements of our faith that... Uh, I know this is hard to understand, that matter, 
<laughs> and why they matter, and, and trying to look at it from a different angle than we typically might look at different doctrines and teachings of the church, rather than just going through uh, a kind of uh, 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 analysis of interpretation, but just why these things have great importance to us and to our faith. And so for today, I'm going to be talking about prophecy, prophecy, and why does prophecy matter? If you remember a while back when I introduced this, I tried to emphasize that faith is both of these categories. And sometimes we tend to emphasize one or emphasize the other, but really they have to be in balance. Faith is clearly commitment and devotion and action and, and practice and ritual and grace and compassion and things like that. That's often how we, we, we visualize faith, but faith is also thought and contemplation and reflection and things that have deep meaning and truthfulness. Um, uh, and again, uh, not to, to be too redundant, but just that, that message that Dr. John McKay said that, that commitment without reflection is fanaticism, but reflection without commitment is paralysis. We need to think about what we believe. We need to think about why we're motivated in our faith to do things. It's not enough just to say, I believe the Sabbath. I believe in creation. Why do you believe it? Because you were raised? Because someone told you to believe it? Or is it because it has become a deep-rooted part of your being? And I like this uh, image of a tree. Uh, that this To be a living entity, the tree, uh, everything that's on top are the things that we see, right? Those are our actions. Those are our behaviors. Uh, we, we, uh, you know, those are the, the, the commitments that we make and our devotions and things like that. But how, how good would this tree live without the roots beneath it? It has to have a good root system. Right? It's got to have the ability. These are the things that are not seen. And these are how we think about them and, and why they have meaning. And the entire thing is important. And it's not a problem to emphasize one. It's not a problem to talk about our behaviors and our actions and our devotion and our commitments. But we also need to, to look at the roots of what makes these things important. And one of the reasons that I think we're losing a, a lot of young people in the church and we have been for a while, is we sometimes get out of balance. We emphasize the visible. We talk about this is what you should wear, and this is what you should eat, and this is how you should spend your money, and this is what you do with your time, and these are how you should order your life. And we forget sometimes to ground them in the reflection and deep contemplation that roots us in our faith. And this isn't just a problem for young people. I think it's a problem for all of us. Sometimes we come to points in our life where we realize, I don't know why I believe what I believe. And so this is an attempt to look at some core ideas of, uh, uh, of our faith and try to put some root system in uh, to what gives them stability and nourishment and uh, make them important in our life. And someone asked me, how many topics are we going to go through this? I don't know. I don't know. I have a few more at least. I pray about it every week, and um, uh, we'll probably stop around 30 or 40, but um, we'll see how it goes. No, we won't go that long, but uh, I, I do enjoy this a little bit of a, a series. And so here's that quote again I used last week when we talked about the cross. And I think it's just well to dovetail into this week's message and to be a reminder of this. I think it's such a beautiful statement from Desire of Ages. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour, okay, a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point. Let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. Okay? Go through the stories of Christ. Think about the uh, parables. Think about the miracles. Let the Holy Spirit guide you in the importance of the life of Christ. And she goes on to say, as we thus dwell upon His great sacrifice, our confidence in Him will be more constant, our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with His Spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. I think that that is well stated, and I think there are a lot of tools that God gives us to guide us in this effort of being able to really uh, bring home into our life and into our experience the reality of the life of Christ. And we should be thinking about it regularly, not just once a week on Sabbath, all right, not just for a few minutes before you uh, have your breakfast and when you pray, but each opportunity that the Lord brings to your mind to dwell upon His sacrifice. All right, one more thing. So I started with creation, kind of the beginning of our faith. Last week I went to the heart of our faith, the cross, and so today I thought we'd go kind of to the end, and I squeezed it together a little bit, the, 
prophecy. The beginning, the middle, and the end which is how we often think of prophecy. Um, and so that's how we're going here. So, boy, these things really uh, kind of squeeze together. That happens sometimes. I think we'll survive. Uh, this is the kids' quiz. So any of the young people here, I would love to have your participation. If you raise your hand. I haven't even asked it, Ketsia, but I'm glad that you're ready to go. Number one, uh, symbols and prophecy. That's what it says here. Got cut off a little bit. Symbols and prophecy and how we interpret them. What does an animal or a beast represent in prophecy? Is there anyone that would like anyone at all? Oh, Ketsia, would you go ahead and shout it out for us? Is it monsters, angry emotions, wars and conflict? No, she is right. It is nations and empires. And still today, we use animals as national symbols, right? We have our eagle, the bald eagle, even the buffalo is a national symbol. What's the state animal of Arizona? Do we have one? Is it the rattlesnake? Raiden? A wing-tailed cat? A ring-tailed cat? Ring-tailed cat. Uh, is that like a raccoon? Like a kawadi? A kawadi. Oh, I'm learning things here. So we still today use animals as symbols of our, uh, of our characteristics of our state or our nation. So there's nothing crazy about that. Number two, what does a woman represent in prophecy? Is it monsters or angry? Oh, wait a minute. I got the wrong ones. There it is. Okay, got to clear that up. What does a woman <laughs> represent prophecy? Is it London? London, what do you have to say? She said it and I heard it. Thank you very much. It is the church or God's people. Always does it represent those that are called by God. Now, when she is a faithful, uh, you know, beautiful uh, woman, then that's when God's people are being faithful and true and things like that. But sometimes she is a rebellious, adulterous woman, and that's when God is emphasizing that his people are being unfaithful. But yes, a woman represents those which God has called into intimate relationship with. It, like, uh, husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church, right? All right? Number three, what do bodies of water typically seize represent in prophecy. And a lot of the animals that are seen are coming up out of the waters. Well, why is that emphasized? So, not this time. Okay, Toby. Yes, it is not armies or soldiers, fish or kings and emperors. It is peoples and multitudes. And basically, when in, in prophecy, this is emphasizing that this, these nations are not arising out of the wilderness or uncivilized places. That would be the land. When it comes out of the seas, wherever there's water, there's people, right? When you were making an ancient settlement, you had to have water. It was one of the core fundamental things. You couldn't just build a city where there was no access to water. You couldn't irrigate that way. You couldn't live. So wherever there's water, there's people. So again, this just, God's not doing, you know, crazy things here. He's using logic and things that people would understand. Number four, what does a sword represent in prophecy? What does a sword represent in symbolism and in prophecy let me give some others a chance here i see ketsia all right i want to let others uh, participate too so owen what would you have to say what is it d d is in power and pride have you been talking to your dad again see that'll just lead you astray every time <laughs> that's a good answer and a sword obviously does kind of give that idea but it's not typically power and pride so, Anna, what do you have to say? What? See, you are right. The Word of God. The Word of God is the weapon that we have that God gives us. The Word of God is where the strength is. Amen? The Word of God is what divides. The Word of God is what leads us forward in our, uh, in our weaponry and in our uh, fighting off the attacks of the enemy. All right, last one. What number appears... 55 times in the book of Revelation. 55 times. And there's only 22 chapters, and this comes 55 times. All right, Eric. 144,000? Wow, wouldn't that be amazing? That's a good guess, but not this time. Not this time. All right, I'm going to let Ryden have this one. He says, B7, 
and he is right. But the irony of this is, it is amazing how much people will focus on the 144,000 and make all kinds, and I'm not saying it's not important. It's a part of the prophecy, it's a part of the vision, and it should receive its, its appropriate analysis and interpretation. But there's all kinds of discussion and argument about what's the 144,000, but the number seven is there way more. I think the 144,000 is mentioned twice. And yet the number seven is just permeated all over the book of Revelation. Seems like God's trying to tell us something, doesn't it? Um, God does that at times. Well, I want to talk a little bit about prophecy uh, with you this morning. And again, why prophecy matters. You know, Adventists have been accused of being obsessed with the apocalypse. Whenever we do an evangelistic series, a traditional evangelistic series, we typically begin with what? Prophecy, right? We begin with prophecy and we, we use prophecy as a, an entering wedge and as a, a, a way of garnering people's attention. And, uh, uh, and sometimes people like that. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it does not always work. But we are definitely an organization that uses and believes that prophecy is important. This is how the book of Revelation begins. And I know you've read this a hundred times, but I just want to just look at this verse with you this morning for just a few seconds. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. And there's a lot more prophecy in the Bible than just Revelation, but I'm going to be mostly in Revelation today. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. The Reve- It's four parts. The revelation of Jesus Christ. That's how it begins. Which God gave him to show to his bondservants. That's part two. The things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John. In a way, everything we need to understand and appreciate about prophecy is in this verse alone. It's in this verse alone. And we're going to get into that a little bit, but just the opening line, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here's a little little secret, a little uh, lead in on this. Revelation and prophecy, prophecy in general, is always about revealing Christ. That's why prophecy is important. Because it reveals Christ. And it is a gift of God's revelation to us from Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Which God gave him to do what? To show us. It is a gift from God to us. And it is communicated through this divine orderly procedure. It is God's message translated through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, born on the backs of angels, through humanity, through prophets and apostles, written down in Scripture for us. That is prophecy. It's the message of God given to Jesus Christ, translated through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, communicated through angels and spiritual ministers, through the human pen and language so that we can understand the plan of God. That is what prophecy is, the things which must soon take place. We'll come back to a couple things here in just a minute. Prophecy is not just predictions, calculations, and speculation. Most of us today, when you hear the word prophecy, the typical thing is that's a future thing. That's a prediction. That's that's something that's coming up in the future. That's really what is kind of from the Greek mindset or the Western mind. Um, When they thought of prophecy, they thought of prediction and they thought of the future. That In their mind, prophecy was always about the future. And to many Christians today, that's also uh, your initial default. That's just where you go. If someone was to say to you, hey, I want to share with you a prophecy, you're most likely going to think about something in the future, right? I don't think that's too big of a statement. I think that's pretty typical. But that is not how the Jews saw prophecy. The Jews had a different worldview. They looked at the world differently. They walked in the world differently. They're more of kind of the Eastern uh, mindset. Okay, They saw prophecy as a pattern of the past. That in order for something to be real and true today, it had to fulfill the pattern that God had established through Abraham and Moses and David and the Psalms and Joshua and, and, uh, and, and the scriptures of old. That's why so much of the New Testament reflects on the Old Testament. 
it grabs the patterns of the Old Testament and says, you know what, Jesus, uh, he is the Messiah because he fulfills what Moses did. Just as Jesus, just as Moses went into Egypt, so did Jesus go into Egypt. Remember when he was a baby? They fled into Egypt. And just as Moses came up out of Egypt, so did Jesus leave Egypt. And just as Moses took the children of Israel through the Red Sea, so did Jesus get baptized in the Jordan. Okay? So most of the Jewish mindset, whenever they thought of prophecy, their first reaction was, well, how does that fit with the past? How is that consistent with the past? So you have these two kind of competing ideas. Is prophecy more about the past or is prophecy more about the future? It's neither. It's both. Prophecy biblically is looking at how God has worked throughout human history in both the past and what his plans are in the future for the benefit of the present. Prophecy is for the present. And sometimes why prophecy matters and why this is important to me is sometimes we think of prophecy and say, well, I'll deal with it when the time comes. Oh, there's going to be persecution and there's going to be a Sunday law. People who believe in Jesus are going to be persecuted. It's going to be bad. Okay, fine. When that day happens, I'll start thinking about these spiritual things. Okay? That's a mistake. Those things are there and those teachings are there and everything that God gives us in prophecy is to bless us and benefit us now. That's why in Revelation 1.1 it says, the things which must soon take place. Some of those things did take place in John's day. But there are things in that... Oh, oh, let me go back to that for a second. I, I want to... More buttons. Okay. Notice that it says, which God gave him to show to his bondservants. Okay? That means his bondservants then. That means his bondservants throughout time. And that means to his bondservants today. These messages are for us today. They were for John. They've been for every successive generation. There has been information. There has been blessing. There has been guidance and things that God wants every generation to appreciate and understand throughout time. And God has had his plan. But it's not just to give to his bondservants then. It's to give to his bondservants universal. Wherever they are. Whatever time they live in. Revelation is there for us and prophecy is for our benefit. Okay, now I need to move on. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14. Oh, I haven't got there yet. Sorry, got out of order here. Out of order here. For many Christians, prophecy is interesting, but not really essential. Or prophecy is complex, confusing, or complicated. And by the way, I don't think that that's necessarily untrue. Um, prophecy is meant to be mined for. It is not just gems lying on the surface that you can just walk up and pick up and put in your pocket and say, well, wasn't that nice? Prophecy is designed to be a journey of discovery. Prophecy is designed to force you to get into the Word of God and study it out for yourself. It is about the journey as much as it is the destination. And many of us who have studied prophecy before or looked at the book of Revelation, you know that Revelation is mostly using language and imagery from other parts of the Bible. You cannot understand Revelation appropriately or with good uh, 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 reliability if you do not know the rest of your Bible. If you do not know the sanctuary system, Jesus is portrayed in the sanctuary in Revelation. If you do not understand the, the, the events of the Exodus, if you don't have a good working knowledge of the Psalms, if you don't have a good understanding of Daniel, you're not going to understand Revelation. Prophecy is designed to make you dig. It's not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be a journey of study and discovery. To study uh, 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 Revelation without taking a consistent look at the other parts of the Bible is like trying to build a house with only one tool. It's like saying, I've got a hammer, and a hammer's a good tool. I'm going to build this house with a hammer. But you have no saw, no measuring tape, no ladder, Okay, no trowel, nothing else to use. And so people use the prophecy sometimes and they bang away. And they say, I'm building something great here. I'm going to hammer this thing together with just a, you know, with just a hammer. And they put together a structure that looks like Eeyore's house from Winnie the Pooh. And they say, isn't this a beautiful thing that God has given us? Prophecy requires the full tool set of scripture. 
in order for us to build a structure that is going to be stable and secure and beautiful. So yes, uh, it, for many Christians it's complex, it can be confusing, but it's meant to be a, 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 a deep dive. God designs it that way. He wants us to slowly and, and over time digest and work on these things. William Miller spent his whole life studying prophecy, and uh, uh, we benefit from just some of the things that he shared with us. For many Christians, prophecy is controversial, divisive, and uncomfortable, and it's just easier to not argue. Let's not talk about the little horn because that's going to hurt someone's feelings. Let's not argue about who the king of the north is in Daniel 11. By the way, you want me to tell you who it is? <clears throat> Actually, it's a good segue. Um, I've invited Tim Rosenberg to come um, in April. He had an opening in his schedule. And he uh, has a whole ministry evaluating Islam and Christianity. So he's going to be here on a Wednesday night um, in April. And it's, gonna, it's a fun Bible study. If you've never heard of his program before, Islam and Christianity, it's just going to be a one-night thing. But he goes uh, deep into Daniel 11. And I think it's a very worthwhile study. But for many, it's controversial, it's divisive, uncomfortable. And finally, for many, it's just simply scary. It's just filled with bizarre images and beasts and persecution and, and plagues and things. And it's just so easy to push off and brush aside and say, well, I like the, the gentle Jesus a little better. I really like how he you know, blessed the children and I, I want to focus on that. I don't want these beasts and stuff. Let's leave that to the scholars and the holy people. They'll figure that out. And there's a temptation to lessen our appreciation for prophecy. But notice what Paul says. This is where it comes in 1 Corinthians 14. The one who prophesies speaks to men for edification, exhortation, and consolation. For edification. That means for encouragement for building up, for, for, for establishing faith, right? Exhortation, prophecy is for instruction and wisdom and guidance and consolation, for comfort, for, for courage. That's what God gives us prophecy for. It's not just about debating interpretations and beasts and horns and powers and statues. Those things are the top of the tree, okay? But we need to understand the deeper root system that is necessary for us appreciation the gift of prophecy that God has given us throughout Scripture. And this is a big topic. By the way, one of the struggles of, of preaching is I have a whole week's worth of stuff I want to tell you, and I only have 30 minutes to give it to you. So sometimes I go kind of fast, and I have to pare it down a little bit. Um, but there's so much more that could be said on this. Notice what Moses says here in Numbers. Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put His Spirit upon them. Prophecy is, is the work of the Holy Spirit revealing God's will to us in both a general and a specific way. And, and, and Moses says it would be great if everyone understood the role of the Holy Spirit in giving us the ability to be prophets, to understand God's word, to be able to deliver God's word to our community and to our world. So here's where I'm going to just share some, some overall thoughts. Prophecy is not a, a luxury to the Christian faith. It's not just something for the scholars and for the historians and those who understand Greek and Hebrew and things like that. Prophecy is essential to our faith. It's essential. Notice this. You all know, well, for Seventh-day Adventists, Revelation 12, 17 is a powerful passage because it says that in the, uh, the days of the, uh, of the uh, controversy between the devil and and, and God, it says that the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went off to make war with the rest of her offspring. And then it identifies those who are of the true church of the faith, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. You, do you remember this? I didn't put it on the screen. I know you guys are all very good Bible students and you know this scripture by heart. <laughs> okay, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Those are the two identifying marks of the remnant people in the last days, right? Is there any Seventh-day Adventists here today? There's a couple of you? Good. Praise the Lord. The two identifying marks of God's people in the last days is that we cherish the character of God as expressed in His law. That we appreciate that God has given us wisdom and counsel in defining who He is through His law. 
And we will stand for that though the heavens fall. No matter what persecution comes, bow down to this idol. No, sir, thank you. I'd rather go into the fire because I'd rather stand with Jesus in the flames than with you out here. We will stand for the law of God, but we also cherish the testimony of Jesus. And the testimony of Jesus means many things, but Revelation itself interprets the testimony of Jesus in Revelation 19.10. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, the testimony of Jesus is when you allow the spirit of God to come into your life and reveal to you the true character of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice something that you may have never noticed before. If you've studied this before and you've been through all the uh, evangelistic series and Bible study guides, the very next words after Revelation 19.10, the very next words, which in most of your Bibles, it separates these two passages as though they're not connected. That's not accurate. They are connected. The very next words after Revelation 19.10 for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy are these words. And I saw heaven opened. That's the very next statement. The spirit, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And when you have the testimony of Jesus and you allow the Holy Spirit to come into your life, remember Revelation 1 1 begins the revelation of Jesus Christ. Prophecy is understanding in our present circumstances who Jesus is and what he's doing. And when you have the spirit of prophecy, when you are willing to embrace the need and necessity of prophecy in your life, then heaven is opened for you. And you are able to see Jesus in ways you've never seen him before. This statement is used three other times in the New Testament. One in the Gospel of Mark, when Jesus is baptized and the dove comes on Jesus. After the dove comes on Jesus, the Bible says, and then the heavens were opened because Jesus was revealed with having the Holy Spirit in his life in a whole new way. And the spirit of prophecy was on Christ and the heavens were opened. The second time is in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, when Jesus meets Nathanael, and he tells Nathanael, Behold, a true Israelite in whom there's no guile. And, and Nathanael says to Jesus, Well, how do you know me? While you were under the fig tree, Nathanael, I saw you. And he says to him, Then you truly are the Messiah. And he says, If you believe this, you're going to see greater things, because you will see the heavens opened, and you will see the angels ascending and descending on the Son of God. You are going to see Christ. You're going to see the Messiah because the heavens are open because you have received the spirit of prophecy. The third time is when Stephen is being stoned. And when Stephen looks up into heaven, it says that the heavens were opened. And Stephen says, I see the Lord standing at the right hand of power. Because Stephen allowed the Holy Spirit into his life. The spirit of prophecy was on him and he could see Jesus. The whole purpose of prophecy is so that we can see Jesus working in our lives, that we can see him standing at our side, that we can see him on the riverbanks of the Jordan, baptized and, and, and receiving the cleanliness, that we can see the angels descending and ascending on him because he is access to heaven. Prophecy is not simply something for the evangelist. It's not simply something that we can, you know, just set to the side and say all those beasts are odd and all those events are strange. Jesus comes to us as we study prophecy and he establishes in our lives a new appreciation and understanding of what he's doing now. Now. Prophecy is now what God is doing in our world. I saw heaven opened. I'm going to start preaching here in a second. Whew, got to catch my breath. Prophecy is a gift. Remember, Revelation 1 said, which God gave to him, that he would then show his servants. Prophecy is a precious gift that God gives us, and we should never neglect a gift that Jesus offers us. He gives it to us for a reason. How shameful would it be if we were just to set that gift on the shelf and say, I'll get to it when I have time. I'll get to it when I have time. The time is now. Doesn't it feel like we're living in an age of prophecy now? Prophecy is true and real. I want to give you a, an illustration of this. True story. David Lodge is an English playwright. He's very famous. Um, if you've, uh, I could name some things that he wrote, but 
Uh, he's an English playwright, and in 1963, David Lodge is in England. He's English. That's what makes him an Englishman. Um, he's living in England, and he is watching one of his own plays. It was a satire. It was a comedy. November 22nd, 1963, and he's watching this play. I think it's in Birmingham, and um, people are laughing because it's a comedy, and um, there's a, oh, Julie Christie was actually in the play, too. Any of you who know Julie Christie, she's um English actress. Um, so she was there as well. But he's watching this play, and in one of the scenes in the play, um, which is a comedy and people are laughing, is a guy goes in for a job interview, and he's listening to a radio. Okay, And the comedy is that while he's trying to get this job, you know, he's playing with this radio, and he's listening to the news, and he's listening to sports, and uh, people are laughing as he's listening to the radio. Well, in 1963, there was, there was no YouTube. There weren't tape decks. It was a live radio broadcast. It, and this is how they'd done the play every time they'd done it. They're listening to the live radio. November 22nd, 1963. And as the play is going on, in the middle of the play, while the guy's listening to the radio, there goes the, the radio goes silent for a minute, and then a voice comes on the radio and says, this is the BBC with a special bulletin from the Home Service. Today in the United States of America, John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. This is the BBC News. Live. Well, you can imagine the, 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 uh, the uh, audience kind of gasped. The actors kind of were thrown back. They forgot their lines. They weren't really sure what to do. They were trying to figure out, is this real? Is this a joke? And, and David Lodge, who writes about this experience later, he says they kind of put themselves together, kind of finished the act, but that was only act one. There was an intermission, and then act two was to follow. And he says in the intermission, people are crying. People are trying to find out the facts. They're trying to figure out, do we even do the play? Sometimes we forget how instrumental JFK was to European peace. For as immoral as he was in a lot of ways, what JFK meant to Europe is enormously important. It's not just his Ich bin ein Berliner speech in, in Berlin. It's also when he went to Paris in 1961 and he said, you know, every man has two countries, their own country and France. And all oh, the French just loved him. He went to Ireland. Um, the, the British press called JFK, this was their name for him, the Minister of Peace. Oh, excuse me, the Minister of Mercy to him. That's what they called him. That's what the British press. The Europeans loved JFK. And when they found out in England, in Birmingham, on that night, in the middle of that play, that JFK, they're crying. But they decided, we, we got to finish the play. And David Lodge says, so they finished the play, but it was totally flat. It just wasn't funny anymore. It just wasn't funny anymore. Now, don't misunderstand the analogy. I'm not saying that we can't laugh and have a good time in this life. But there's a lot that we do in our life that is theater. There's a lot of our world that is escapism and things that we do that do not really have any meaning or application in eternity. We can get lost in politics. We can get lost in video games. We can get lost in entertainment and sports. We can get lost in our occupations. We can get embellished in the theater of this life. And every now and then, we need to hear the radio signal from God saying, this world is not your eternal home. And that's what prophecy does. It reminds us that there is a real world away from this theater that we are in. Prophecy comes into our experience and says, wake up. Wake up. There is a serious thing happening. And you need to be aware of it and ready for it. Prophecy is true and real. Prophecy is a command. If we had time, one of my favorite passages to study in Revelation is Revelation 10. Revelation chapter 10. And it's this book where the little book is open. And John is invited to eat the book, if you remember that, which is to consume the Word of God. And it was sweet in the mouth, but bitter in the stomach. And as he's talking with the angel at the end in verse 11, it says, you, John, must prophesy again. You must prophesy again. Prophecy is not all just sweetness and sugar. Prophecy is also bitter truths that sometimes we need to consume and understand. It's so easy to sometimes just say, well, I love gentle Jesus. And I love the stories of the uh, of caring for the lamb and seeking out the lost. That's a beautiful element of the, the, the truth of Jesus Christ and of His power. But He's also the living God that has the sword coming out of His mouth in Revelation 19. 
He is both. And the sweetness of the truth of God can be in our mouth, but the bitterness of the reality of sin must also be part of our experience. This is why prophecy matters. But we are commanded, friends. We are commanded to be bearers of prophecy. You must prophesy again concerning many peoples, tongues, nations. And lastly, and this is where I'll end this morning, prophecy is a blessing. It is a blessing. Notice how the book of Revelation begins and ends with a kind of two bookends of the purpose of the book of Revelation. Revelation 1.3, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things that are written in it for the time is near. You're blessed if you read it and if you hear it and if you do it. God enriches you. He makes you full. He blesses you, makes you happy. And then the book ends with the same admonition. Admonition. Thank you. Isn't she great? Revelation 22, 7. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Revelation, prophecy is more than just the book of Revelation. And again, there's broad ways of looking at it, and there's general ways and specific ways, but prophecy is more than just dates and beasts and schedules and estimates, speculation and interpretation. Prophecy is God's gift to us, worthy of our investment of time. It is the sweetness and the bitterness that God brings into our life to remind us This world is not our eternal home. And we are a people of prophecy. And I have no problem saying, yes, I am obsessed. I'm obsessed with the revelation of Jesus Christ. I want nothing else in my life than to know Him more, to see Him high and exalted, to see Him beautiful and alive and working in my life. So yes, prophecy is essential. We need to understand and appreciate what God has done done for us. And that includes, friends, the spirit of prophecy as it works through the life of Ellen White. I'm going to end with this. If you are not utilizing the counsel and messages of God's minister, that he rose up in these last days and appreciating the counsels of Ellen White, you are missing out. You are missing out on encouragement and instruction and blessings that God has in store for us to appreciate from Ellen White's writings. Maybe an amen might be appropriate at some point. Be happy to... uh, talk more with anyone who has questions about that, but I wanted to share that in the context of prophecy. I hope that you will take more seriously in your life the opportunities to study prophecy. And when there's a prophecy event or when there's a literature or when the Lord is just in your devotional life drawing you to the books of Daniel or or to uh, Isaiah or to the book of Revelation, that you will look at it as a new and a beautiful tool that God wants to uh, build your faith um, before he comes again. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, uh, again, Lord, I I know that there's a whole, a whole additional message that could be shared, and, and this is really just scratching the surface in many ways. But Father, I pray that this would be a reminder to us all of why prophecy matters, that it is more than just uh, a, a, an assembly of ideas that that uh, only matter in a certain context. But it is a revelation of yourself. It's both from you and it is about you. And so, Father, I just pray that you would help us in our journey of Bible study, that you would help us in our investigation and interpretation and our putting together what your message is. It is not always easy, and there's going to be things that we're not going to truly and fully understand until you come, Lord, but slowly and surely you are drawing us closer to yourself as we study your prophecy. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for revealing yourself to us so that we can see you as our Savior. 
we ask that you would bless us and that you'd be with us the rest of this day. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Lord bless you. Thank you again for worshiping with us. We hope to see you next week.